So now let's take a look at an example. And what we'll start off with, we'll start off with a circuit and windmill. And I'm going to show you how this is set up in windmill, then I'll show you the equivalent circuit in OpenDSS. So basically, we've got a source shown here on the left. Um, the source is actually regulating the voltages at this particular point. We've got a step down transformer. We've got a line and we've got a, a load. Uh, normally, the regulated point would actually be here, but just to kind of keep things simple, I, I don't have a regulator in this case. And so I'm just simply regulating it on the source side of the circuit. And so you've seen this before, where basically I'd have a, a model here from my source. I have it regulated. I could define some impedance associated with the source. I can put my transformer in the circuit. I put in the correct primary and secondary side values. Um, I would also have the transformer impedances. In this case, I'm using the transformer model. And then what I could do is I could define the parameters for the overhead line. So this is 336. Uh, this just shows the conductor information. The only reason I'm doing this is so you can just see for yourself how this resistance and conductor information is going to get mapped to OpenDSS. I could have information about the spacing between phases. I can have information about the, the load. I could have this be an imbalanced load. And so anyway, when we run this, then I get these power flow results. And just the thing to note, I guess, would be what are the voltages and what are the line flows um, toward the end of the circuit. So then when we do a comparison to OpenDSS, you can see that the results match up. One nice thing about using the commercial programs is everything in the outputs organized fairly well. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up an OpenDSS script for this. And in this particular case, the way this would get done is you can actually do an export from Windmill. I'm not going to cover that right now. I just don't want to make things too complicated. And uh, another thing I'm going to do just to kind of keep this example a little bit simpler is I'm not going to just yet model this regulation. I'm just going to assume this is the voltage behind an impedance. So one thing about OpenDSS that's a little bit different than commercial power flows is that you are not regulating a voltage unless you have a voltage regulator in the circuit. The fact I put a source in there does not regulate voltage in OpenDSS. You need to put in a separate voltage regulator object. And so at this particular point, it's just a, a voltage behind an impedance. In the example that I'll post up on the Moodle site, I'll actually give you the full-blown code for this. But in this case, this is a little bit simplified, so I'm not putting too much out at the same time. But anyway, it's the same model. Um, I have my source, I have my transformer, I have my line, and I've got my load. And so when you define this in OpenDSS, usually you start this off with the clear. What this is going to do, it, it's going to define your circuit um, from scratch. OK, so you just clear out anything that's already in memory. And then I'm going to set up a new circuit. And this circuit's going to be called simple. Um, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit the voltage source. And I'm going to go to set this up where I have three phases. It's going to have a per unit internal voltage of 1.05 per unit. The base KVA is shown here. It's got an internal positive sequence resistance and positive sequence reactance. Um, I also have voltage values associated with the zero sequence as well. So this is defining my, my voltage source. Um, the reason I would edit in this case is that this definition of a circuit would already come with the source defined. So then I can define a new transformer. In this case, I'm going to call this transformer TR1, just a shorter name. Again, I talk about the number of phases, number of windings. The X to R ratio is about eight. Uh, and then I give information for windings one and two. So this is how OpenDSS is a little bit different. 
since you could do like three winding transformers and you have to manually put in the information for windings one and two. And so basically the from side is connect the source bus, the two sides connected up to sub bus. Uh, I'm gonna have three phases, three, I shouldn't say three phases, I should say nodes. I'm gonna have three nodes on the primary side. Now it's Delta connected, so there's no fourth node. I'm gonna have four nodes on the secondary side. This is uh, grounded. And then you basically say, what's the connection type? You talk about what's the voltage, you got the KVA rating, and then you define the percent resistance. And so when you have the X star ratio and percent resistance, that gives you all the information you need. If you had core losses, you can include these in here as well. Now what I'm doing is I'm defining some information for my line model. And what I'm doing is I'm specifying new wire data and I'm basically loading in data for a one aught conductor. Um, and it's called one odd underscore D1 underscore ACSR underscore D1 underscore six slash one. Where that long name comes from, it comes from the um, windmill export. But, but anyway, you can give it the current limit. You can give it the, the AC resistance. You can give it the GMR. Um, units are in feet for those numbers. You can give it the radiance the radius and you can give us the, the units of the radius. You can define all that stuff. So again, this is a little bit of a, a simplification of what I had for the, the original windmill circuits. I just didn't want to get into too much detail on this script right here, but I have the, the detail on Moodle. Now what um, I've, I've done in here is I've included the um, impedance information for this 336 wire. And you might ask, well, why don't I just simply um, um, putting the spacing information and do it based on that? And I certainly could do that, but keep in mind also that this is based on doing an export from Windmill. And what Windmill does internally is it, is it calculates these impedances for you. And so what I'm doing in this case for this 336 conductor is I'm going ahead, I'm just pulling in this impedance matrix directly from windmill. Um, where you would use this conductor information is this is the, the thing you need to have to get the ampacity loaded in still. But if I had the construction information, I certainly could put the construction information in and then I could actually have OpenDSS do the, the um, the line impedance calculation for me. So now I've got equipment data and I got equipment data in for the, the wire. I got equipment data in for the combination of the, the wire and the construction. So I basically pull in the impedance matrix from windmill. Now what I can do is I can define a new line. And so I'm going to define a new line called L1 and it's going to be connected up um, between sub bus and L1, all right? And so the from side, the bus one side, is gonna have three nodes. The bus two side, you can call that the, the two side, I guess, it's gonna have three nodes as well. It's gonna be 5,280 feet in length. Um, units are in feet. And basically the line code associated with this so we can give it an impedance is gonna be this 336 line code. Again, it was really, really long because this is something I exported from Windmill. Now, when we do the project in class, we're gonna do an export of the part two circuit basically. And so you, you don't really, for the your work at least, need to be so concerned about getting all this stuff just right because this is gonna happen on the export. Where this gets tricky is if you're kind of doing your own modeling and you're, you're putting stuff in from scratch. We're also putting a, creating a new load. Uh, the load is called cons one. It's got three nodes associated with it. We're connecting it up to a bus called L1. It's gonna have three nodes associated with it. This is 7.2 kV, three phases. Um, you can put in maximum and minimum voltages associated with this. You can talk about how it's Y connected. You can give it uh, 
kilowatt and k-bar numbers. And what I'm doing in this case is not, I'm not inputting in imbalance, so I'm just assuming it's balanced for now. And if you look at the example on the Moodle site, you can see what this would look like if we were going to do it imbalanced. The other thing you could do is you can put it in what are called zip model coefficients. So you can say, well, what part of it's constant power versus constant impedance. And so anyway, now we have all the, the line and uh, load and the transformer and the source model in, entered. Then there's other settings you could have in here. So you can talk about the earth model being Carson. You can give a growth factor, maximum iterations, things like that. Um, these are all just kind of like kind of standard values. One other thing you need to do in here too is you need to enter in what you want to use as the voltage basis. And so in this particular system, note there's 115 kV as one voltage base, there's 12.47 as another voltage base. Um, so you can actually define what you want the voltage basis to be. And note at this case, we're not saying where these voltage bases are at in the circuit. We're just saying what levels we're wanting in our model. Um, basically, what you're doing in this case is you're, you're, you're doing a calculation um, and for the voltages. And what this is going to do, this is going to trigger some things internally that's going to kind of help you set up your, your per unit system. And then what we're also doing in here, too, is we're um, setting the KV base um, for transformer one to be at this level right here of 12.4699. Um, this is one thing that's a little bit confusing about OpenDSS and that OpenDSS engine actually works in terms of volts, amps, ohms, all right? If you want to get information out in per unit, you basically have to, to put all the, the per unit information in separately. So again, it natively does all the calculations in volts and amps and watts, et cetera. It doesn't do internal calculations per unit. So what you're really kind of doing is you're kind of defining things that are going to be used for more for display purposes. Um, anyway, when you're ready to run the, the voltage drop analysis, the iterative analysis, then what we're going to do in here is we're actually going to um, solve then. And then if you want to show certain things like voltages, powers, and currents, then this is a command here which actually spits out the appropriate values into text windows. And you'll see when we run examples what, what this is going to look like. And I probably will be run various examples in the Monday calls rather than kind of doing that here. So when you run this, what happens is these different windows are going to pop up and they're going to show results for voltage, power, flow, and current. And one thing you note in here is that this is really kind of a raw format. Um, basically, it's not a nice structured output like the windmill output. It just basically dumps out everything it knows in terms of voltages. It gives you magnitudes and angles. It gives you results in per unit, given that you put in the base values. Um, it talks about um, all the, it has all these different angles for you for the various nodes. So it gives you a lot of raw information right here, but it's probably not the sort of thing you want to show directly um, in a report or to a client. You, know, you have to kind of pretty this up a little bit. And so you would pull this into a spreadsheet and, and probably clean it up if you wanted to use this report or take some of these values and put these into tables. So this is a difference between a super user program like OpenDSS and a commercial program like Windmill is that this is not set up to give you nice formatted reports. You have to do that on your own. And so note, you can get the various power flows in the circuit here. Um, you can also show what the line flows would be. And if you compare this to um, the original windmill power flow, you see they, they match up pretty close. But it's a whole different type of a format in terms of looking at the different values. And what's kind of confusing in this case is if you have like a, a line element, you know, in terms of the, the orientation, 
of the values, you know, a lot of times it's doing it, say, like going out. And so what it kind of looks like, you know, when you're looking at values is you get sometimes values that are negative because the orientation um, is in the opposite direction of what you would normally expect. So anyway, just be aware that you have to put a lot of more time and effort into interpreting the, the values. Um, as far as these commands, as far as the format of the commands that you use in OpenDSS, the, the way this works is you would have a command and then you could put in different parameters associated with the, this command. And these would be, um, if it's positional, delimited by using commas. But one thing you'll note about these commands and the parameters is they could be positional or they could be named. Now, what I mean by named is that you're using an equal sign all the time and you're linking the value up to a specific name. So this example here, if I'm, I'm creating a new line object, note I'm saying that bus one is B1240, bus two is 32. Line code is 336 ACSR. I'm using this equal, equal, equal. This is all using the naming convention. The other thing you could do as far as defining an object is you could just have everything be based on position. So it just knows that the um, first item you have here is going to be the, the bus one connection. The second item is going to be the bus two connection. The third item is going to be the line code. But this means it's up to you to make sure this everything's in exactly the right order. Otherwise, uh, you're going to have a misentry of data. I usually would stick with the named entries. If you were going to automate something, um, I guess you could use the positional approach. But the positional approach for entering stuff in manually is kind of dangerous. As far as the command verbs that you have, you can have a new object, you can edit something, you could set something, there's solve, um, show something, you can export, and you can plot. And so these are some of the more common command verbs that you would use. And then when you're putting values in array format or string format, then you have delimiters as well. And you have a lot of different delimiter types as far as the square brackets or the italicized brackets or these types of brackets or using double quotes or using single quotes. If you're entering a matrix, then between rows, you could use this line, this line, op, this line symbol here. If you have value delimiters, you could use a comma or you could use a white space. Um, when we're defining objects um, of a certain class, we use a period number to kind of denote um, the separation between a class and an object. Um, the, the value separator for named objects is going to be an equal sign. If we want to just extend something to the next line, we could use this kind of a squiggle symbol here. And if you want to put comments in, if um, you have a whole line, you could use, you know, this double slash. If you have a comment in a line, you could use an exclamation point. And then if you want to make a, a query, you could use a comma. And so you say you'll see some examples later on of all these different sort of delimiters. So if we're putting in an array, you know, maybe um, some voltage values like 115, 6.622. 6 you could use the square brackets. You could put commas between them, or you could use the square brackets and just have spaces in there. And when we're putting in a matrix, say like the three by three, then here's your, like your first row, your second row, and your third row. And we're using um, this up and down line symbol to separate the rows. And so if I'm putting in like a, um, a resistive matrix, it's three by three, note how I enter this. Now, one thing this is doing is taking advantage of the fact that these matrices are symmetrical. And so if it's symmetrical, if you have a three by three, you really just have six pieces of data that are relevant because this could be flipped around its axis. And so note what you're doing here is you're doing this term and then you're um, doing these, um, sorry, 
Yeah, basically what it's doing in this case, it's, um, yeah, basically defining this term and it looks like it's defining this term and defining this term. And, and again, since you, you normally would get this directly from an export, you usually don't even have to worry about this. Um, so you could put this into a compressed format or you could just have this show everything like in three by three. Now, as far as the, the script file structure, as I mentioned before, a lot of times we're going to break this up into a lot of small files. And so like all the line code information would be in one file and the wire data would be another file and the line geometry would be another file. This is kind of like your equipment libraries. Okay. And then you're going to have your circuit definition for your your transformer objects, your line objects, your loads, and et, et cetera. Usually the way you do this is you set up a master file and what the master file does is it pulls in all these other small files. And this would maybe be your base case. Now let's suppose you wanted to customize your base case. You want to make some changes to it. Then what you do is you put this into a run the master file. You would make the changes you, you want for a particular case uh, in conjunction with running this, this base file here. And so the way this might actually look is let's suppose I've got a, a base case for what's called this 123 bus test feeder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compile this and this is going to kind of load this circuit file into the distribution system simulator. Then what I may want to do is I might want to override some things that are in that base case. And so what I'm doing in this case is I'm changing some of the set points in a regulator control. And then what I can do is I can solve and then I could decide what sort of things I want to show. All right. So this is typically the way you organize things is when you do an export, this will actually create like a master file that pulls in all this other information. Normally, instead of making your modifications in this master file, you would create a second sort of run the master file. And then depending on the case you're running, you, you make your changes to the base circuit and you make changes in what you want to display and things like that. It's kind of up to you how do you want to do it, but this is the, the recommended way. So again, different things we could solve for. We can run snapshots, uh, iterative power flow. We can run one iteration. Uh, we can run quasi-static analysis over a day or for a year. Um, some peak day in the year, we can run it for that. We can run short circuit harmonics in Monte Carlo. I'll give you some templates for the analysis that you're going to be needing doing for your um, project. But just keep in mind that the snapshot mode is the default mode. And so if I export something out of windmill, it's going to default to running snapshot analysis. So this would make it similar to running a power flow, commercial power flow. What you have to make sure of is the, the control mode set to static. And what's going to happen if you have different controllers in the circuit, then depending on their time delays, the controls with the smaller time delays are going to execute first. Um, you can modify control modes externally. Um, make sure your monitoring devices are set to sample. So you see this in some of the templates I'm going to give you. And then once this runs, it'll give you some summaries on whether this worked or not. So you'll see like an error window pop up if something went wrong. One thing about um, running this sort of program is internally the program is going to have what we would call like a bus list. And so let's suppose you define um, like some bus called um, source one and you define another um, bus point. Um, just trying to think of names that we would want to use in here. 
Um, we don't want to call this bus one, two, three, because that might that might confuse you. So let's say it's like alpha, beta, gamma. Okay, these are the bus these are the bus names in your circuit. All right. So internally, what the program actually works with is like a bus one, bus two, bus three, bus four in terms of its internal little calculations, right? So basically what this program does is you don't really do this bus internal bus numbering for OpenDSS. When you define the circuit, basically what happens is um, that it figures out like based on how you enter the data in, like whether this is bus one, this is bus two, and this is bus, yeah, bus three, and this is bus four, right? This isn't something you normally need to worry about, but just realize that, that OpenDSS is doing this sort of bookkeeping for you. And it's basically kind of defining a bus internal bus list. And then when you, run a solve or you're calculating voltage bases and or if you can actually do this manually is when it actually does this this bus list creation for you so if you're a programmer this is what you'd be more concerned about um, but just realize that what open dss is doing is based on the ordering that this information is being processed it's going to create an internal bus list where it's going to have numbers one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, up to the number of buses you have in the circuit. Um, we we talked, we showed this a little bit before. You have this calculate voltage basis command that um, you can actually use. Uh, again, OpenDSS doesn't work in terms of per unit values, and so this is just kind of more for your convenience. Um, basically, what you can do is you have a command for specifying a voltage base at like given buses in the circuit. Um, basically, in order to work this all out, it's, it's, it's solving a power flow program. And it's actually figuring out how the voltages are going to change in the circuit based on your transformer models, you know, how the transformers are actually adjusting voltages. And then what this is going to do is based on the voltages that this calculates, what it's going to do is when you use this set voltage basis command, it's going to match up what it gets from the, the voltage drop analysis to what you define as these levels. So let's suppose that when it ran the circuit, it actually saw the voltage be like 12.3 kV. Well, what it's going to do is it's going to look for the closest value in your voltage base list, and it's just going to set that to be the per unit value at that point. So this might be a little strange. You might be thinking, well, why does it, um, why isn't this input into the data set to begin with? And again, um, the reason it's set up this way is that OpenDSS doesn't work in per unit. It's just simply using these values right here to make it more convenient for you to interpret the data set. And the problem with this would be if for some reason if these voltage bases are really close to each other, and when OpenDSS solves, it might lock into the wrong voltage base. Okay, so just keep this in mind. OpenDSS works in terms of volts, amps, and ohms. Okay, uh, and that's the way a lot of these commercial programs work. A per unit might be a nice sort of thing if you're working stuff through by hand, but in terms of the way a lot of these commercial programs work, um, they would actually work in volts, amps, and and ohms. Uh, another sort of mode you have, which we're going to be using for the project, is dynamic daily mode. And so, you know, we're going to be running 24 hour analysis. Uh, default load shape is defined as default, but I'd say I'll give you some templates for this. Um, you can define like what your resolution is. And so, if I'm running like 15 minute data sets, I can you know, have like 96 points and I could set a step size to use in OpenDSS. And so basically what it does is you have some sort of initial value for your simulation. Normally it's time equals zero. And then what you could do is you increment this by a, a step size. And then what it does is it, it solves the snapshot 
at that next time increment. And then any sort of meter or monitor you have in a circuit, um, its values would get updated or added to, let's say. And if you're not finished yet, then you just simply go back to, um, I think this actually should be go back to two. And then you increment the time step and you continue on. So anyway, you could do this on a daily basis. You could do this in yearly mode. Um, basically, the difference in this case is we would have to use a slightly different setup as far as using set year. Um, anyway, we won't be using this right here for our project, but just realize you could use, do this for a year as well. And then when you put an energy meter into the circuit, these energy meters are, are kind of interesting as they have a lot of different registers. So this is like a, like a real meter, would have different registers for capturing different sort of information. And so, you know, you could capture kilowatt hours, you can calculate K bar H, this is different measures of energy. Within a given time span of operation, you can calculate the maximum peak value that that meter saw. Um, you could calculate uh, a lot of different types of items associated with this. And so we'll, we'll see this later on. It's kind of hard to discuss it without some examples. And so what I'm going to finally do is I'm going to go through some examples on this. I know this lecture is getting kind of long, but this is going to be pretty useful information later on when you do your project. And when I do the next lecture on DER part three, we're going to kind of jump to quasi-static analysis. So if you want some more detail on how to do the snapshot analysis, I'm just going to go through one more lecture segment here and then talk about how we take this example I use in the windmill um, lecture and how we convert that to OpenDSS and then how we would add like PV to that as well.